There is a divine design. It's written into the universe, into our bodies, into the natural world, and into the spiritual world. It's something that you can know, live, and it's something that can change who you are. And for the better, I would think. I mean, the divine design sounds like a pretty trustworthy brand, right? So it's got to do something good for us. And you don't have to look out into the realms of far out spiritual stuff to get this. Everything physical here abides by this pattern. Everything exemplifies the trinity of purpose, means, and results. Everything reacts to the spheres of procreation and protection. We're living right now in a connected outermost layer of reality, which is constantly interacting with the far out spiritual stuff within. Hey everybody, welcome to Swedenborg in Life. Stuff is cool. You could quote me on that if you want. Now what I mean is that the more we are able to study things and the more modern technology allows us to dig into the nature and the mechanics of things, the more amazing it seems to be. And this is something that Emanuel Swedenborg was noting and I think pretty succinctly here in 1763, he wrote, the deeper we look, the more wondrous are the things we run into. So things are organized and things are cool. But what is all this stuff we're learning pointing us towards? I know there's a big kerfuffle going on about is there intelligent design or is there not intelligent design in the universe? To me, that wouldn't be the headline. It would really be, is there loving design? Because I don't care if there is God and God is very smart and designed the universe in a very complex way, but it didn't do anything to save people from suffering or build a happy future and we were just kind of left out in the cold. I, I don't care. I don't care if it's intelligent. What we're looking for is a loving designer. So Swedenborg asserts, based on his observation of the spiritual side of life and how that equips us to look at the physical and, and understand what's underpinning it, God is the source of everything and God is both. God is intelligent and loving. This is a somebody with an unlimited supply of loving feelings and an unlimited supply of intelligent thoughts. And those actually form the basis for everything that we experience here. He wrote in Divine Love and Wisdom, the universe was not created out of nothing, but out of God. This means that God is the same from first to last in the largest and smallest things, which already we're dealing with some kind of being that doesn't follow the, the laws of physics, because how can you be in everything? Even, it doesn't matter how big or small it is, how do you fit in both, like even inside a clown car. It means also that this person is at the heart of everything created, but non-spatially so. So you dig deep enough into anything, there's God. But it does, it's not like God is the shape that spreads out to everything. God is at the heart of everything, non-spatially. So everything should include physical stuff. Like God is at the heart of this desk here. I don't, how does that work? Obviously, that's what we're dealing with in this show. But before we get there, let's remind ourselves as we explored last episode of why all this stuff exists in the first place. Swedenborg wrote about the grand purpose of creation. The term grand purpose is a translation of the Latin words finis universalis. Universalis means, as you can see, universal sort of overarching or applying to all things. Finis is the Latin word for end. You can see our word final in it. It refers to the purpose or aim of any action or effort. So when we undertake something new, we use the term end in view to mean the final purpose we're aiming for. In this section from Divine Love and Wisdom, you'll hear the words purpose, means, and result words that have traditionally been translated end, cause, and effect, and used in the historical discussion of Western philosophy. Here's Divine Love and Wisdom 169 and 170. Throughout the created universe, in its largest and smallest instances alike, we find these three, purpose, means, and result. The reason we find them in the largest and smallest instances of the created universe is that these three are in God the Creator. The grand purpose, or the purpose of all elements of creation, is an eternal union of the Creator 
with the created universe. So any person who has love to give wants someone to give it to and an environment in which to be able to express that love. God seeks a union or a relationship with us and with all of creation purely for the sake of giving and blessing. That's what divine love wants, to give happiness. So everything was created in such a way that it could benefit everything else and also receive benefits. Swedenborg calls this usefulness. In True Christianity 67, we read, before creation, God was love itself and wisdom itself. That love and that wisdom had a drive to be useful. Without usefulness, love and wisdom are only fleeting, abstract entities. God created the universe so that usefulness could exist. Therefore, the universe could be called a theater of useful functions. So that's why. That's the why behind everything. And we got to take that as a foundation as we move into the how the universe was created. If you want to learn a little bit more about the why, check out the last episode that we did. God used a specific design to create heaven for more about the, the motivation for God to do such a thing as that. But also in that episode, we talked about how creation or reality started on the spiritual level. In brief summary of that, the first thing created was the spiritual sun, which is this aura around God that extended outward, creating atmospheres in descending levels, first spiritual atmospheres, then physical atmospheres, and on down finally to the more static level of physical matter. And again, check out that episode for more. Let's talk a little bit though, now that we've descended all the way down to the stuff you and I seem to be made of, this physical matter, what is its nature? This is Divine Love and Wisdom 305. There is nothing of absolute divinity in the material substances that make up Earth. No offense to those substances, but they are still derived from absolute divinity. By being connected with their source, the substance of this spiritual sun, they retain something that is in that sun from divinity. As noted above, this was the aura that envelops the divine human one, the Lord. You really, mate, go watch the last episode or else how are you going to know what all this stuff is? The material substances of earth arise from this aura by extension from the sun, by means of the atmospheres. So you can't think about the physical universe as separate from the spiritual layer of reality. This physical universe is derived from and sustained by this spiritual world, the spiritual plane. And that is why Swedenborg had to go and get this understanding of the spiritual to fully even understand the physical and how it works. So you had this divine creative aura that's radiating out. And by means of that and the design, the pattern that's inside of it, you have this orderly continuum, which is going all the way from the highest, uh, most spiritual substances all the way down to where we are here in physical matter. And if we're looking at how did physical matter start, how did what is sometimes called creation begin, you've got to realize that, that it wasn't some kind of anomaly. I mean, the, the process of creation as it happened is happening all the time. So this is Divine Love and Wisdom 155. Creation itself cannot be described intelligibly unless you banish space and time from your thoughts. So out, out space and time. To the extent that you can, banish them and keep your mind on an image that is devoid of space and time, because that's how the spiritual side of life works. If you do, and this is like a fun little you know, retreat mental exercise, just try to banish space and time from your mind. If you do, you will notice that there is no difference between the largest expanse and the smallest. And you will inevitably have the same image of the creation of the universe and of the creation of any particular feature of the universe. The best way I can picture that, the largest and the smallest, you just think about you know, observing a huge part of space. But then think about if you could you look into a microscope and see this little bit of space in between, you know, the two points on either end of your frame. It's just space. Like, it's a, as much space as you can see there. So Swedenborg is saying, look, the creation of everything, which sounds really big, that same exact process is going on in everything that's really small and going on in things that happened a long time ago, but also in things that are happening right now. So how did Swedenborg get to that? Point. Well, let's hear a little bit about his process of learning how physical creation happened. 
At first, Swedenborg was really struggling with this concept of the creation of the universe. In True Christianity 76, he wrote, For a long time I meditated on the creation of the universe without success. Later, when the Lord sent me into the spiritual world, I became aware of the futility of drawing any conclusions about the creation of the universe without first knowing several facts. There are two worlds, the one in which there are angels and the other in which there are people. Then I also saw that there are two suns. All spiritual things flow forth from one of them, all physical things from the other. The sun that all spiritual things flow from consists of pure love from Jehovah God. He is within that sun. The sun that all physical things flow from consists of pure fire. Swedenborg was given the insight that the universe was created from God's love by means of God's wisdom, both of which are actual substance. After understanding that, everything Swedenborg observed in the spiritual world and everything he observed in the physical world confirmed that understanding. Swedenborg goes on in True Christianity 76. When I was in a state of enlightenment, I saw that there were spiritual atmospheres that were created by means of the heat and light from the sun in the spiritual world. At their core, those atmospheres are substantial. Each one led to the next. Because there were three of these atmospheres, and therefore three levels of them, three heavens were made. This spiritual universe could not exist, however, without a physical universe in which it could accomplish its useful effects. Therefore, at the same time, a sun was created as the source of all things physical. Through this sun, by means of its heat and light, three atmospheres were created to surround those prior atmospheres, the way a nutshell surrounds a kernel or the inner bark of a tree surrounds the wood. Finally, through these atmospheres, the globe of lands and seas was created. Here, people, animals, and fish, and trees, bushes, and plants were created out of earthly materials consisting of soils, stones, and minerals. Swedenborg then finishes up this description. This is only a very general sketch of creation and its stages. God did not create the universe out of nothing. Nothing is made out of nothing. God created the universe through the sun in the angelic heaven, a sun that comes from his underlying reality and is therefore pure love together with wisdom. The universe, meaning both worlds, the spiritual and the physical, was created out of divine love through divine wisdom, as every single thing in it witnesses and attests. If you consider phenomena in the universe in a coherent and sequential way, you will see this clearly. You must keep in mind, though, that the love and the wisdom that become one in God are not love and wisdom in the abstract. Think of them as a substance in Him. God is the absolute, the first, and the only substance or essence that exists in itself and subsists of itself. So to understand creation overall, you've got to know that there are these two planes of existence, the spiritual and the physical, that God works through, and they're intimately united, and they, they need each other, these two different planes, but they're different. They act differently. And in the spiritual world, you have a lot of things that seem similar to the physical world. You have organisms, and you have landscapes and surroundings, but they come into existence in a different way than things like that do here in the physical world. And actually, there was an angel who was filling Swedenborg in on just how this worked. In the spiritual world, God creates things in a moment to match the feelings of angels. While in your world, things like this were originally created in a similar way, but there was a provision for their perennial renewal from generation to generation, and so creation goes on. The reason why there is instantaneous creation in our world while in yours there is a creation that continues across generations, is that the atmospheres and soils in our world are spiritual, while those in your world are physical. Physical things were created to cover spiritual things, 
the way animal or human skin covers the body. Inner and outer bark cover tree trunks and branches. Membranes and meninges cover brains. Sheaths cover nerves. Coatings cover nerve fibers and so on. For this reason, all things in your world have constancy and perennially return. Then the angel added, Pass on what you have seen and heard here to the inhabitants of your world. Until now, they have been in total ignorance about the spiritual world. Yet without being notified of it, no one could even guess, let alone know, that in our world, creation is still going on, and that when God first created the universe, something very similar to this happened in your world. So it seems to be indicating that physical creation started out as this spiritual world style, instant manifestation of divine thoughts and feelings, but then God set up this system of renewal from there. Was that first manifestation something like a Big Bang? I don't know. I bet it's interesting to think about, right? But physical matter, seemingly around life in particular, couldn't keep going if there wasn't this constant stream of inflow into it from the spiritual world, which is part of this perpetual creation. Swedenborg wrote about this in Divine Love and Wisdom 340. There's a constant inflow from the spiritual world into the physical world. The two are talking all the time. Unless people realize that there is a spiritual world, they cannot know anything about this inflow. In its own right, nature, physical matter, is dead and contributes no more to bringing things forth than a tool contributes to the work of an artisan. If it is to accomplish anything, it needs to constantly be activated. So physical matter is like a tool. Spiritual energy slash matter is like the hand holding the tool. It is spiritual reality, reality that finds its origin in the sun where the Lord is and that goes to the limits of nature, that produces the forms of plants and animals and causes the miracles that we see in both, filling them in with earthly substances so that the forms are stable and enduring. So there is a spiritual underpinning to biology, it sounds like. We can therefore see that plants and animals have come into being solely from the Lord through the spiritual world and that they constantly keep coming into being through it. This means that there is a constant inflow from the spiritual world into the physical one. So the miracle of creation is happening all the time. So that means life, I would imagine the evolution of life, is this constant activation by spiritual forces of physical matter. And so you as well, by the way, the fact that you exist means God is flowing into you right now. People are like, oh, nobody loves me. Somebody does, because that, that is the means by which you continue to subsist, is this activation of the spiritual matter in us, the physical matter in us, that is life. So there's this ongoing creation, rather than, okay, how did it happen back in the past? There are instances of it everywhere, you know, at, our, at our fingertips, within our fingertips. So how does God do that? Because something fascinating about the way the Swedenborg describes the spiritual world is that it's ordered and structured just like the physical world is. So if God is doing something uh, that's having effect in both of these planes, there is a means by which it's happening. So how does God manage this ongoing creation and preservation? There are two main auras that originate from the Creator and that then continually flow through the design of creation in order to preserve the universe. These auras carry a loving purpose and a wise design. The two main auras in creation are the aura of marriage love and the aura of protecting what has been created. About the first one, Swedenborg writes this in his book, Love in Marriage or Marital Love. There is an aura of marriage that radiates from the Lord through heaven into each and everything in the universe, all the way to the lowest parts of it. This sphere of marriage fills the universe and reaches throughout it from its beginnings to its ends. We can see this in the marriage of heat and light that makes life possible, in the marriage of the sun and the earth to produce life on this planet, and this aura flows down to every way that marriages and matings continue to produce life. About the second aura of protecting what's been created, Swedenborg writes, also in his book, Love and Marriage, it is part of creation that the things created are to be kept intact, guarded, protected, and sustained. 
Otherwise, the universe would fail. And we can see this in all the ways that humans and animals feel inspired to take care of their young and all the protective aspects and plants that guard them against things that would inhibit their growth. There are also harmful auras flowing into the earthly plane from hell that give rise to harmful things like diseases and poisons and toxins, often made worse by human actions that cause disorder and pollution. But the steadiness of God's protective aura can be seen in the amazing immune systems in humans and animals, and even plants, and the cleansing systems in nature. As we wake up to the need to stop putting toxins into our bodies and environments, those systems can better do their job. People have observed what you might call the immune system in nature, as discussed in articles like How the Earth Can Heal Itself If We Let It, and How Does Nature Repair Itself After an Oil Spill. There are many subcategories of auras from God, but they all come back to these two, the aura of marriage to produce new things and the aura of protecting what's been created to sustain those things. These auras are emanating out from God across all of reality, across the whole universe, but the creation actually goes full circle because of you and me. We are able to, through what we do in the world, close the loop and connect back to the Creator. This is Divine Love and Wisdom 314. The process of creation of the universe goes from its very beginning, the Lord clothed with the sun, to its limit, which is the soil in the, in the physical world, and from this, through its functions, back to its very beginning, the Lord. And that circle doesn't function unless we step in and play our role. We are the essential link in this circle. This is, again, Divine Love and Wisdom. The grand purpose, or the purpose of all elements of creation, is an eternal union of the Creator with the created universe. That union, by the way, is what creates that heaven we referenced in the previous show. This does not happen unless there are subjects in which His divinity can be at home, so to speak. Subjects in which it can dwell and abide. For these subjects to be His dwellings and homes, they must be receptive. What does it take to be the home of the Lord? It must be receptive of His love and wisdom, apparently of their own accord, subjects who will, with apparent autonomy, raise themselves toward the Creator and unite themselves with Him. In the absence of this reciprocity, there is no union. Okay, who are the subjects? Who's going on and on? Is it somebody we know? We are those subjects. People who can raise themselves and unite with apparent autonomy. So we, because we can in freedom understand what love is and admire it and want to join with it, what truth is and admire it and want to follow it, we can connect to God. We can choose God. This can be creation opting in to God. Through this union, the Lord is present in every work He has created. So we can make it so that God gets the presence in everything that God is longing for. As a result, the functions of all created things rise level by level from the lowest things to us and through us to God, the Creator, their source. So we can be part of making the Lord fully present and everything, which is pretty great, makes us seem pretty cool, and obviously we've messed this up a lot. I mean, you can tell we, there's a lot of deviation from the divine design in the way that we harm each other, we harm ourselves, we harm the biosphere and other elements of creation, but that doesn't negate the potential we have when we do things well, when we do rise to the challenge of being our best selves, that the results are spectacular, and that this is what makes the whole thing work. So one person at a time, you or I, can make the effort to, to reconnect what's been disconnected. And this is a really important role that we play. True Moore described it in True Christianity. All aspects of the divine design have been brought together and concentrated in us so that God can perform the highest forms of useful service through us. So you have some serious hardware in you. Useful service is what love intends and what it occasions through the means. When useful service results, love and wisdom take on a real existence. So we can bring this potential that's radiating out from God into existence. Because those spheres, the sphere of, of procreation and the sphere of preservation, it doesn't happen. They, they, they aren't just doing things on their own. They're doing it through us. They inspire us to say, this is good. Let's, let's carry this forward. So we are here to do the highest forms of useful service. So let's do it. I mean, this is something we can participate in right now. We can, we can, undo damage, we can repair harm, and we can play the role that we were meant to play, which is fulfilling this ultimate connection of God to the universe. And when that connection is made, 
the divine design has a chance to make everyone as happy as it wants to, which was the whole point of the whole thing in the beginning. And if you think, well, that's not me. I, I'm not really part of that. I couldn't possibly have such a cool design attached to me. In the next show, we are going to look at how even our own bodies reflect and are sort of an index of that divine design. So join us as we look at how our bodies connect to God's design of the universe. We want the ideas and insights we cover to be available for free to anyone, anytime they need them. As a nonprofit, we depend on donor support to continue to create high quality programming. This season, we're featuring the opportunity to support our newly established endowment fund for Off the Left Eye. Consider your ability to be a part of our growing family by going to otle.cosvox.com today to make a one-time or recurring donation. Your support helps the ideas in our content reach and nourish thousands of people every day around the globe. We couldn't do it without you. Give if you can, receive if you need. If we cycle through in this way, in the end, everybody wins.